Cooperative Development Services. We're a cooperative development uh, center, a nonprofit organization headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, with a program office in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we are 25 years old. Uh, we work primarily in the upper Midwest in the areas of value-added agriculture and renewable energy, and nationwide in the area of food cooperatives. Uh, we have seven employees and uh, over 20 consultants, and among those consultants are 16 individuals who specialize in food cooperatives. The food co-op community uh, that we have today is a result of several previous waves of, of historical development. Uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, uh, an estimated 20 or 30 food co-ops were started around the country in response to issues coming out of the Depression, uh, absence of grocery stores in communities, um, uh, those types of issues. Uh, fewer than 10 of those remain today. In the late 1960s and 70s, somewhere between 500 and 800 food co-ops were formed as part of the social change movement that uh, was going on at that time. Of those, about 250 or so have survived, and many of those are uh, still thriving today. In the last 10 years, we have noticed a third wave of cooperative development uh, beginning uh, in the food co-op community. Uh, CPS began to receive more and more inquiries from uh, individuals and communities who wanted to have a food co-op close to them. And so our organization joined with the National Cooperative Grocers Association and with the National Bank for Consumer Cooperatives, NCB, to form a program called Food Co-op 500. The vision of Food Co-op 500 is that more and more food cooperatives will exist in the United States, all of them effectively serving their members. Our intention with Food Co-op 500 is to provide resources that make it more likely that a startup effort can succeed. Uh, startup efforts like we presume most of you in the, uh, uh, that are participating in this call are involved in. And that we want to provide tools and expertise that can support you in those efforts. Part of that process is going to be involved sharing the successes of others and the learnings that we've had from the uh, work that we've done to date. And this webinar uh, series that we're uh, involved in is a part of that effort, and we'd like to welcome all of you. One of our key assets in this program is the work of a dedicated individual, uh, consultant to CDS, Stuart Reed, who is the National Food Co-op Development Specialist uh, affiliated with CDS. And Stuart, I'd like to uh, toss the ball to you and ask you to say a few words about Food Co-op 500, please. Thanks, Kevin. Um, as Kevin said, I, I work with co-ops around the country that are work, or groups, I should say, around the country that are working to start food cooperatives. And uh, it's been hugely rewarding for me, and I think uh, we're learning more every day about how we can support you as groups. Um, many of you that are participating in these webinars have already had some contact with our organization. And if you have not already, I will be, we will be sending out um, a follow-up survey which is basically intended to get the information I need to put you in a database and be able to contact you when other opportunities for training come up and so that we know who's out there and how we can get resources to you. Um, <clears throat> that won't be a survey that asks how you like the webinar. This will just mainly just be for contact information and it will come separately. But uh, for those of you that I have had contact with, um, welcome to the call. And those of you who haven't, I look forward to meeting you. And I think that's all I have to say right now. Thanks, Stuart. Let me now introduce Mark Goring, a member of our uh, food co-op team. Uh, Mark's work is in the area of governance, but today he's also serving in the role of technology support. And uh, Mark, perhaps you would like to uh, I can say a few words about uh, how this webinar process works and um, uh, some of the mechanics, please. Yep. Thanks, uh, Kevin. I just have a couple things to point out. Um, it's hard to kind of picture perhaps where you're sitting, but there are uh, more than 60 people um, connected to the computer and possibly more um, than that connected to the phone uh, for the audio portion. Um, we will be using the written question and answer um, mechanism that's part of the GoToMeeting software. And I just want to point out where that is on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, uh, for those of you who are have your computers connected, um, there's a box underneath, enter a question for the staff and a send button. And um, 
Uh, if you have questions that come up during the session, if you would write them down and send them, and Stuart and I will be um, kind of queuing them up uh, for the question and answer segment. And my understanding is that we're mainly going to be organizing that into three kind of batches of questions and answers, and we encourage you to send in your, your questions um, during, the, during the webinar, and then there will be kind of some defined um, times for the answer part. Um, and then uh, if there is uh, time uh, for you to, to actually engage in the conversation, uh, just pointing out that uh, very few people actually have voice privileges coming on the call and for you to, be, to speak and be heard, you need to press 6 on your keyboard or on your phone and then to mute your line, uh, you press 6 again. Um, so those are my two announcements. Thank you, Mark. So just a couple of other uh, announcements. Uh, this is the second webinar in a series. Next week, uh, same bat channel, same bat time. Uh, January 23rd, we will be taking up the topic of governance and accountability and would welcome you to consider signing up for, uh, uh, for that webinar as well. Today's materials are available on the website and a recording is being made which we uh, expect to be able to make available later. Uh, after uh, after uh, completion of the uh, uh, of the session, uh, there will be an evaluation at the end of today's session, and we would welcome you to uh, uh, give us some feedback um, with regard to the uh, uh, to the content of the uh, program and and uh, so that we can uh, improve the delivery of uh, service that we're uh, we're trying to bring to you. Without further ado, let me introduce to you Marilyn Scholl. Marilyn is the team leader and coordinator for our food cooperative consultants uh, and uh, uh, one of the fine colleagues that I get a privilege of working with. Marilyn will be the presenter in today's session. Marilyn? Thank you, Kevin. And um, I want to introduce Elizabeth Archer, who I've invited to join me today. Elizabeth is the member services director of the Wedge Co-op in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Wedge is one of the, the most successful co-ops, both as a business and as a cooperative. And I think that's in no small part due to Elizabeth's commitment and vision. And uh, she's one of the, the people that I turn to for advice and support in the area of membership. And so I asked her to join us today. So thank you, Elizabeth, for coming in. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me and for the kind things you just said. Uh, it, when you ask uh, questions, feel free to address them either to Elizabeth or to me or generally, and we'll decide who is, is best equipped to answer it. Um, about five years ago, Elizabeth and I and a few other people uh, met in Northampton, Massachusetts with a co-op that was forming there called River Valley Market. And uh, as we speak, the, the trains are set up and they are constructing the building there in, in River Valley Market. They hope to be open in March. Uh, but at that point, four years ago, they were. it was the beginning of the wave of uh, the third wave that Kevin was talking about. And several of us from uh, existing food co-ops met there to review what we had learned over the course of our careers and the co-ops that we had worked with. And we put together uh, what we called the best practices for membership programs to help River Valley Market, as they were starting a new co-op, take advantage of all that we had learned. Then about a year later, we took that information and uh, held a conference with it and invited um, membership and management specialists from all the food co-ops to attend. We had over uh, 200 people who came to that conference. Oh. And uh, we shared uh, the best practices with them, uh, took their input and feedback, made some revisions. And so what I'm presenting to you today, uh, while I'm presenting it, it really is uh, me standing on the shoulders of uh, the, particularly the four women who met in Northampton and beyond that, the 200 who met in, uh, in uh, 2002 to to share uh, to design an ideal program to share the best we have um, we have discovered in our work uh, over the last 30 years. So uh, with that said, uh, Mark, if you would go to the outline uh, for today's session on page two. Uh, so we're going to cover three topics today. 
We're going to talk about the overall economic relationship with member owners in a cooperative, a member owner investment, and member owner economic benefits. And I will pause at the end of each of those three sections to address any questions that you've typed in or comments that you've typed in in that period. Next, uh, we're going to look at what is a cooperative. I just want to start there. Uh, this statement is taken from the International Cooperative Alliance Statement of Cooperative Identity. A cooperative is an autonomous association of people voluntarily united to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. I want to pause just a minute uh, before we move on to emphasize the very last word there, enterprise, that food cooperatives are businesses. And in order to be successful, uh, they need to be successful as businesses and as cooperatives and find a seamless balance of their success as a cooperative and as a business. Uh, but without business success, uh, we don't uh, meet anyone's needs, and so uh, having a business with a very special, unique, and powerful ownership structure that cooperatives have, it's still always important to remember that we are businesses. This slide uh, focuses on the uh, full set of the cooperative principles. Um, there's a link there to the ICA website. Um, for you uh, to go. We looked at that last week. I won't go into any more detail there, but I think that all of you who are involved in working to start a cooperative spend some time uh, finding out a little bit about the, the history of the cooperative principle. Today we are going to focus on principle number three. Then we'll move to the next slide where principle number three, economic, member economic participation, is highlighted. So the third principle, economic member participation, speaks first that members contribute equitably to and democratically control the capital of their cooperative. That's going to be the main focus of section two of our webinar today, how members contribute capital. The second part of the principle talks about that at least some of that capital is the common property of the cooperative, and by implication, some of the cooperative, some of the capital is uh, owned by the members uh, while it's being invested in and used by the cooperative. The third part is that, is that the members usually receive limited compensation, if any, when capital subscribed as a condition of membership. This is one of the powerful and unique features of cooperative ownership compared to any other kind of ownership is that in a, a traditional business model, the owners invest for the purpose of receiving compensation on that investment. In a cooperative, members invest because they want to use the services of the cooperative. And any compensation on that investment is usually limited. The uh, last part of the member economic uh, participation principle is that um, members allocate surpluses to any or all of the following purposes. And that would be developing the cooperative, benefiting members in proportion to their transaction with the cooperative, and other activities that are approved by the membership. So surpluses would be the amount of funds that would be left over at the end of the year after all the expenses are paid. So as, as a cooperative, members control that surplus, usually through the elected board of directors, and make a decision about which of these is the best use of that surplus. The third bullet there, benefiting members in proportion to their transactions with the cooperative, uh, that is the principle that underlies the idea of patronage refunds, which we'll be focusing on in the third section of the webinar today. Next slide, please. 
go uh, back for a minute and, and look at ownership as a general concept. Um, ownership of a business. Um, and so these uh, things on this slide are about any type of ownership of a business. And then we'll take a look at how cooperative ownership is unique. But first, uh, uh, for any type of business, owners assume responsibility for that business's success. They provide the capital, they control the business, and they benefit from the business they own. The economic results of profit belong to the owners. Next slide, please. Some of the unique features of cooperative ownership. In a, in a co op, the members control on a democratic basis, one member, one vote, as opposed to in a for profit, uh, I'm sorry, for a uh, uh, corporate owned structure where the uh, control is based on the number of shares and the amount of the investment. In a cooperative, the member's benefit is based upon their use rather than on the investment. The more one uses the co-op, the more one benefits. Uh, third way that cooperative ownership is unique is that members benefit both economically and socially from the business that they own. So they're not in it not just for the economic benefit, but because they have a, a need and the co-op exists to serve that need. And this, I want to put a pause right here and just tell all of you how inspiring it is to me the hard work that you're doing to start co-ops in your community. Um, I've had the good fortune to live in a community uh, that has a co-op for the last 30 years, and that's it been, and I've lived in five different places, but every place I've lived has had a cooperative. And uh, I, I feel so fortunate and happy to be able to shop in a co-op. And I can imagine uh, how much you might want to have a co-op in your community, and I wish you the best in being successful um, in, in starting co-ops in your community. It's very inspiring, the work that you're doing. <clears throat> Um, getting back to the slide, uh, sorry for that little aside, I was having an emotional outburst, I guess. Um, <laughs> members um, seek mutual benefit in a cooperative, that none would benefit at the expense of the others. And uh, lastly, again, through the Board of Directors, members allocate the surpluses uh, to these activities that we, we noted before in the principle, developing the cooperative, building reserves, uh, patronage refunds, and supporting other activities that the owners value. Uh, next slide, please. Continuing on the theme, uh, the reason that cooperative ownership is unique is because of the importance of the relationship between the member and the cooperative. That a, a cooperative really only exists because of the members, to meet the needs of members. If members don't have needs, there's no reason for a cooperative to exist. Um, a, co a cooperative, therefore, is defined by and draws strength from that relationship. The cooperative's products and services are tailored to those uh, specific member needs, and so the, the co-op's likelihood of success is high uh, because it has determined that members have needs. Uh, that the co-op can meet those needs, and the members want the co-op to be there to meet those needs. So it's a very uh, valuable and symbiotic uh, relationship. The, uh, there's a close connection between the success of the co-op and the success of the member. Uh, member owners are not only the source of capital, but they are also the source of control, and they are also the source of sales. So the ideal a mechanism for creating an economic linkage is to have incentives and or rewards uh, that encourage the co-op to serve the members and for the members to patronize the co-op. Uh, for more information and an in-depth study of uh, some of these ideas, I really recommend uh, this uh, paper that is uh, listed there. The, the link is there. Uh, Brett Fairbairn, the three strategic concepts for the guidance of cooperatives, the first of which is economic linkage, the second is transparency, and the third is cognition. 
again, today we're focusing on the third one, the econ or, sorry, the first one, the economic linkage. Um, moving to the next slide, we look at continuing uh, how the co-op draws strength from this from the relationship with the members and and vice versa. Why do the members invest capital in the co-op? Well, because they trust that doing so will be their own interest as well as the interest of other members. The key word there is trust. Cooperatives earn this trust when members perceive that the co-op is effective and is able to meet their needs, is dedicated to serving their needs, and not any other organization or any other group. So for that trust to happen, the co-op must actually be an effective agent, must be a successful business, again, must serve their needs well. Um, the members must also perceive that, uh, and that perception is created both by communication and education, uh, but also by the experience in the store so that the members can perceive in the co-op in every decision, every activity that the co-op makes decisions because of its understanding of a member's needs and wishes. So that's the end of the opening session. I want to stop there and um, first invite uh, Elizabeth to make any comments if she'd like to about how you guys play out at the wedge. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Well, I know it all sounds pretty dry, um, but it is in many ways the heart of what makes us a co-op and not a club or, you know, just another business. And we learned, you know, I've been here since 81. The Wedge started in 74. We really learned the hard way um, by disbelieving <laughs> in investment. I believe I paid $3 to join the Wedge initially. Um, we had working members, so-called, but... They didn't necessarily work hard or well, but they drained the store of discounts. We really learned that the capital investment piece has to be uh, explained. And again and again, every year with a page and a refund, we again explain the fundamental co-op because it's not something most people spend their days thinking about. Um, and every year, the new members, a handful of new members, get the letter and call and demand to know what good the reinvested portion does them, et cetera. And it's really important to um, become firmly rooted in this part of cooperative theory so that you can explain it convincingly, uh, not apologetically, not doubtfully, uh, because what organizers and staff say to members really does have a huge impact on the trust as the co-op builds. Is that enough, Marilyn? Thanks very much. Sure. Yeah. Uh, next slide, Mark. And then, um, Mark or Stuart, have you accumulated any questions at this stage? We have a few. Stuart, would you go ahead with that? Sure, I'd love to. Um, all right. The first one is, could you, uh, there's a, people frequently talk about the triple bottom line. Mm. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, sure. I think uh, when people talk about the triple bottom line, they mean the economic bottom line, the social bottom line, and the environmental bottom line. Um, there, there may be other definitions of the triple bottom line. Those are the ones that I think of. Um, the cooperatives must uh, be successful at meeting their members' needs. And part of the challenge of that is understanding what those needs are. So for many food co-ops, um, uh, the leaders have, um, through dialogue and relationship with their member owners, determined that members uh, are interested um, not just in a store, but they're interested in a community, and they're interested in a different way of doing business in that community. So they have some social needs. Um, other uh, co-ops, uh, food co-ops, have identified through dialogue with their member owners an interest in um, changing the way we relate to the planet and environmental protection, uh, looking at supporting organics and uh, local agriculture as a way to preserve and enhance our environment. And so if the, uh, it's the responsibility of the, the leaders of the co-op to have a good um, relationship and understanding of the values of the member owners and then to be sure that the co-op meets the needs of its member owners. Those may be defined as 
in, in, in more ways than just the economic one. Today we are going to focus primarily on the economic relationship uh, while acknowledging that um, all of the members' needs are important. Another one, Stuart? Sure. Um, clarifying question. Um, you mentioned on your, one of your slides that the surplus belongs to the owners. And is the surplus from all sales or just the sale to owners belong to the owners? Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on that in the third section, but I, I will just say briefly here that um, the owners own the co-op as a whole. So all the surplus does belong to the owners in common uh, in a at, in, an, in the end of the year process of determining uh, whether or not there will be any uh, patronage refunds or patronage distribution, the first uh, piece is to allocate which of the profits came from member sales. And an individual owner would only be entitled to their share of the profit based on their share of the sale. But in common, the uh, membership owns, the ownership owns the entire business and all of its assets. Carolyn, the questions are coming in fast and furious, so when, if we have more than you can handle, let me know, and I'll try to prioritize them. Okay, let's take uh, maybe two more now, and then we'll move into the uh, next section. All right. Um, percentage of shoppers that are members on average. Elizabeth, you want to answer that one for the wedge? Well, I can tell you that our uh, retail sales are hovering between 76 and 77 percent, I think. Well, it looks like it's, uh, I don't know how old this report is, uh, probably around 76% retail. Uh, we have a blended percentage because we also have a wholesale warehouse. So at the end of the year, it looks like it's 67% because co-ops that are members buy from the warehouse. But in the store itself, it's 60, 76. Now, let me say that when I started this job and we had a working member program, and we went to the National Co-op Bank for a loan. They laughed us out of the store. Our sales to members were like 4%. So it's really important to give people a firm reason to believe they should do more than shop at your co-op. Uh, we've worked our way up. You know, when I became member services director, it was 14%. And I'll tell you, the best thing I ever did was hire a cashier who had worked for Clean Water Action and gone door to door um, signing people up. You have someone who's not embarrassed to ask people to join, and it's amazing once they're invited how happy they are. Thanks. It's my uh, experience is that it, the range is uh, 50 to 75 percent for uh, most of the co yeah. Next question, sir? Sure. One more. Here anyway, the, uh, please distinguish the various ways that members contribute capital to the co-op. Uh, members contribute capital to the co-op by writing a check, giving a card number, or handing you cash. <laughs> I, I wonder if that is what the I, I think we're looking at, my guess, Marilyn, is that the, the, the questioner wondered, um, you know, between membership share equity versus loans or other kinds of uh, classes. Okay, okay. Uh, we're going to get into that uh, a little bit more in the next section. So, Mark, I think I'll just ask you to flip to the next slide, and we'll answer that question by looking at the next slide. Um, if we didn't get to your question now, I hope we'll still have time at the at, at either the end of the next section or the following one. Um, and if we don't get to them at either of those times, um, we'll be sure and, and share our email address and phone number so we'll have a way to get you an answer. Um, member uh, shares is one type of capital, and it is the one that we're going to talk about today, but in, in answer to the, uh, the previous question, I'll talk a little bit about capital in general. The, the primary sources of capital are debt, member equity, and profit. So for a startup co-op uh, without having business operations to generate profit from, you have the remaining two sources of, of debt and member equity. Uh, there may be a few other sources of capital. Um, in uh, two or three weeks, Bill Gessner is going to present a webinar on uh, uh, including the a development budget, and so he'll get more into the sources of capital in that webinar. Um, but today we're going to talk mostly about 
the member share capital, um, but there there are some other sources. So uh, member sh member investment member capital is a, a share program that has two goals. Uh, one is that it provides the club with an adequate capital base, and two is that it creates a sense of ownership among members. There are of the multiple types of capital that I mentioned, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, today we're talking about member share capital, so I'm going to focus on the features of those, uh, for, of that type of capital. First of all, it's not taxable to the co-op. It's an investment on, and therefore not taxable to the co-op. It can be a relatively low cost for the co-op to have member shares, interest-free. Um, remember the co-op principal said that there is uh, usually a very limited, if any, um, dividend on investment capital. The next is that it provides a base in order to leverage debt capital. Um, a, a bank will require that the owners put up an investment in the business before the bank will leverage that investment. So the, the member owners of the business need to provide base capital. Uh, another advantage of cooperative capital is that many people provide relatively small amounts that can add up to a sizable base fund. And lastly, it's an important demonstration of the amount of support that your cooperative has. Uh, continuing with the next page on member shares. Uh, the, the member share investment needs to uh, be sure and contribute to an adequate capital base. We're going to look at a formula in a little bit about how you would determine what a member share value uh, could be. Uh, member shares also need to be flexible as the needs of the business change. Uh, can strongly recommend, urge you to please never use the term lifetime when describing the capital requirement of your business. Um, hopefully you've done a good analysis of what the capital needs of your business today, but we hope that your co-op will be successful and will be here uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 100 years from now. Uh, we do have uh, a neighboring co-op, the Hanover uh, co-op, that, that started in the 1930s, and the, needs, uh, the capital needs of that business today are quite different than the capital needs were uh, back when they formed. So uh, as the as owners of the business, as the capital needs of the business change, the contribution of the owners needs to be able to be changed. Uh, next, I want to be sure and mention uh, to be sure that your shares are structured to be sure that they are exempt from taxation and any securities law. I am not going to go into the details of that. Um, I trust that you will seek appropriate legal and accounting device advice uh, in, at some point during your structuring process to be sure that you have ensured those exemptions. Uh, next is we recommend that the member shares be equitable uh, with a member uh, for each membership, whether it's held by an individual or a household or whatever, that a membership is a membership is a membership and has the same uh, investment. Um, if you have members who have different and difficult financial situations, we recommend that you use a payment plan to accommodate those as opposed to having different amounts of requirements. Um, the payment plan should be uh, relatively simple. You don't want to have a, a dozen payment plans, but you can have uh, uh, one plan that is paid in full at the time of joining, one that's paid over the, the course of uh, uh, 12 months or so and then one that could be paid over a longer period of time to make it possible for people of, of uh, limited means to be able to join as well. Uh, lastly, remember that the, as an investment, the, the uh, share is refundable to the members uh, should they ever decide that they no longer need or want to use the services of the cooperative. So the, it belongs to the member, it's an investment, it's their money, but because they want the co-op to exist, they will invest it, put it on deposit, so to speak, in the cooperative to put it to use for them to help them meet their, this need that they have. 
uh, just a note here that uh, while it is refundable to members, your refund policies uh, should include some restrictions that would protect the solvency of the co-op. Um, a few more comments on the member investment program. You want it to be as simple and easy to administer and maintain, uh, one that's fair and discourages cheating, minimize any administrative fees, and uh, would only be changed with member understanding and support. Um, got one more slide on um, member shares uh, in general. Um, as an investment, member shares are refundable to the members upon termination should they no longer want to join. And I mentioned briefly before uh, about placing some limits on those. Uh, here are just a couple of ex examples of how you might want to do that. Uh, refunding capital only after replacement capital has come in from another member or no refunds if the co-op has negative net worth or the refund would cause net worth. Um, you can also deduct any amount the member might owe the co-op from that investment before returning it. Um, should a member leave the co-op and not request their share back, it, it still is their share and belongs to them, um, but you may have trouble finding them if they move without claiming their equity. So you want to be familiar with the laws in your state about what you, uh, what options you have around that and have a plan to address any abandoned or unclaimed equity. Next slide uh, talks about uh, how much. Um, many existing food co-ops, as Elizabeth mentioned, established their equity structure um, 30 or more years ago and uh, uh, now have to think about the capital needs of the future in thinking about that equity. Uh, but many of them um, haven't gone completely through that process yet. So comparing the capital needs of your cooperative to existing cooperatives may not be the most productive um, path for you as new co-ops. What you need to do is think strategically about your cooperative's long-term capital needs and base your equity requirement on those capital needs. We talked about before there are other sources of capital, member investments, earnings, retained patronage, and debt. Um, so you can consider all of those as you do your analysis on your long-term capital plan. Uh, another option you may want to think about is an, an, an annual investment uh, for every member to invest a set amount each year that would continually build capital for your co-op until you get yourself up and running and profitable. It may be also easier for members to understand and afford. Um, the next slide gives you an example of what I'm talking about with a, a strategic uh, thinking about your capital needs. Um, your, in your case, you might want to uh, go through a similar kind of exercise to this. Uh, this example um, is of the new community co-op. And this co-op has determined that they need a million dollars in capital to open a successful food store. Well, I want to just pause right there and say I used a million dollars because it's easy to work with. Um, it may be uh, not the right amount. It may be low. Uh, uh, and an amount of capital uh, for a, a successful food co-op, but it's just one, it's an easy one to start with. Generally speaking, 30 to 50 percent of that capital will need to come from the member owners. So once again, Bill Gessner is going to do a workshop specifically on this topic in, um, I can't remember, three or four weeks, so watch for that. Um, but for today, we'll just use this kind of simple example of 30 to 50 percent, so 300,000 to 500,000 uh, in capital would need to come from the member, o member owners. Let's say that a sources and uses budget uh, pro projects that uh, 20 to 25 percent of that will need to come from member equity. And then we have some other sources there, member loans and other sources of debt. So. We're looking at uh, 150 to 250,000 in this example that would need to come from member equity. So a feasibility study might project that there would be 16 
hundred people who had joined before opening and a thousand more in the first two years. So you take the, the high end of that capital need and divide that by the 1,600 members and see that it's approximately 150 per member is the capital need of the cooperative for this cooperative. Now, obviously, if a co-op needs two million in capital to start, it would need either twice as much equity per member or twice as many members or um, some combination of the two. Um, got a couple of more slides here on the member share program uh, before we'll pause again to take your questions. Uh, next slide is the, how the member share program benefits both the members and the co-op. I'm just going to pause here for a minute to uh, take a drink of water and see if Elizabeth, you might want to comment uh, on anything at this point. Um, this uh, slide. Well, hmm. this is probably the great under-educated piece of the co-op, and you're going to come back to it again and again because this is a, uh, a let's face it, money is a touchy issue in people's lives personally, and many people interested in starting co-ops tend to, although not exclusively by any means, a lean towards a progressive or kind of liberal perspective of business that's highly negative. So uh, as soon as you start saying capital, you can really get people, people can start, you'll trigger their buttons, whatever their buttons are, you're going to push them. So it's good to develop a form of language to talk about it. Uh, a lot of clubs use the term fair share, um, that sort of thing. So I, I suggest you really know your community and sound people out before you roll out your materials, uh, because it really is, once you win them over, they're yours, you know, they're putty in your hands, I, I, I mean it, but <laughs> if, if they're still triggering, uh, if you're triggering any kind of anxiety or political beliefs or any kind of reactivity around money, uh, this will be the thickest part of your program. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this, this slide is just to, to summarize some of the key benefits uh, to the co-op and to the members. Uh, remembering that the uh, the relationship be between the co-op and its members is mutually beneficial. That the co-op exists to serve the members' needs, and the members' uh, desire for the co-op to be strong and successful so that it can continue to serve their needs. Go ahead to the next slide, please. This is some of the concepts that you want to be sure that your member investment plan communicates. The first on this list is ownership. Um, a mutually beneficial relationship between, exists between the owners and the co-op. Now, I mean here communicating ownership. It, to me, it's not quite so important what you call them, whether you call them members, call them owners, member owners, shareholders, um, but whatever you call them, uh, you want it to communicate ownership. Ownership is a different um, message. In our society today, uh, membership often means something quite different, like I pay a fee or some dues and I get some benefits for a year. And the, and the reason that I would do that is, to, is because of what's in it for me. And so membership can create a sense of entitlement. Like I'm entitled to something. Ownership is, it creates a different mentality and a mentality of this mutually beneficial relationship of responsibility. If you own something, you want to take care of it. You want it to be strong and healthy, and you want to benefit from its existence. You want it to continue to exist. So whatever term you use, be sure it communicates uh, both the term and the program communicates ownership. Next, that it communicates investment, that the money does belong to the members. It's theirs. They will get their money back, assuming that the co-op succeeds. Um, of course, if the co-op fails, the owners, the money is at risk, uh, so you don't. there's no promise that they'll get their money back. But the assumption is, of course, that the co-op will be strong and healthy, and when they no longer want to be a member, they'll simply fill out a refund form and get their money back. So it's 
it is their money. Uh, they're not trying to receive some, uh, get that money back along the way because they know they're going to get that money back at the end. Uh, next one that communicates value, uh, that the member investment helps your community have a cooperative. Without member investment, there will be no cooperative in your community. Uh, and if, you're, if people in your community want a co-op, they'll need to invest in it. You cannot give a co-op to a community. But a community can grow one. They can invest in one and create one. Uh, next is fair share, that the club's overall capital needs are divided among its members. So the, the, the share requirement is based on each member's fair share. Uh, you know, there are some other structures that exist, uh, both member loans and investment shares, that could allow for the cooperative to, to take greater sums of money from people who have more money and who want to invest more money or lend money to the cooperative. Uh, that's a, a slightly different instrument than the share. And so in the share, we're talking about a fair share that it's uh, equitably divided amongst all the members. Uh, consistency, I mentioned at the beginning of this slide, it could be either ownership or, or uh, membership, owners, members, member owners. Uh, but whatever terms you select, uh, use them consistently so that you can communicate effectively in a clear message. And then lastly, your member investment plan should be flexible. Uh, so that as the capital needs of the co-op change, the uh, investment requirement can also change. The next slide uh, speaks to language um, and being careful to use terms that communicate that shares are an investment, uh, such as share, your share, invest, investment, uh, refundable, uh, et cetera. And uh, be very careful to avoid inaccurate terms. It, it's uh, very confusing for people um, when they hear terms that are not appropriate. Um, I'm not even going to say these words out loud. But <laughs> see them there uh, and strike out slide. And to the extent that you can erase them from your your brains and your your language, and certainly from your documents when you're talking about ownership and investment and share uh, and uh, and deciding on the capital needs to be provided by owners in your cooperative, the more successful you'll be at being able to communicate ownership. Marilyn, may I chime in just ever so bright? I also won't say that three-letter word that starts with F, that's the fourth word in your strikeout. We call that the F word here. I tell you, the uh, entire American population will install the word annual in their head if they hear fee come out of your mouth. And then you are going to have problems annually, <laughs> forever. Yeah, good. So, yeah, that's why it is so important. Who knew that something somebody said at the cash just 25 years ago is still going to haunt you? It will. There are some uh, cops that do have a, a small fee as a part of their um, program, and the next slide goes into a little bit of, of detail about that. Um, if you do have a small fee that's an administrative fee, be sure to minimize that. Um, yeah. Be sure and know that fees or dues are taxable income uh, to the cooperative. They're not investment. They're not refundable. Um, they don't provide ownership. Um, however, if you do have any administration, administrative fee uh, that it that's okay. It just should be very, very small and not ever confused with equity. Um, I'm ready to take your questions about this section. Well, it's just in time, too, because they're piling up good. All right, we'll start um, with the earlier ones here, and I'll try to kind of group a few together. But um, one question was whether there should be multiple types of memberships, like for farmers or people of different income groups. I, no, our, our opinion is that there should be one um, membership uh, structure for uh, membership as a membership as a membership. Mm -hmm. uh, what I focus this presentation on is consumer-owned cooperatives. Uh, so if farmers are 
buying from the co-op, they're purchasing their goods from the co-op, they would be, uh, could be an owner, but in that role, they would be an owner as a consumer, as a user. Yeah. If you're interested in uh, hybrid structures, uh, employees or farmers or, or others, uh, there may be some folks who have expertise around that and who might be able to help you. Uh, my particular expertise is in consumer food co-ops, so that's all I'm able to address. Uh, but I do recommend um, the same uh, member membership, no differences for uh, how people choose to live their lives, how many people they live with, whether they're married to those people or not, um, and no matter what their um, income is. Again, if if they, people have uh, economic challenges, my recommendation is that you uh, create one payment option that allows payments to be made over a long period of time to minimize any single payment, but still have the same investment, an equitable investment for all members. Marilyn, here's one that I hear a lot from the groups I work with. At what point in the startup process should a co-op ask for member dollars? At the first meeting after incorporation, and what happens if the members in, to the members' investment if the effort fails, and how do you explain that? Um, the member equity uh, selling shares should happen after you've done uh, some work, some strategic work, and you know what the capital requirements of the business are and you know how to structure your member share program. So you should not take member equity at the first meeting. Now, I understand the question is slightly different. It's when should you take member dollars? Um, my sense is that uh, at the early meetings, you may be able to collect a, a few dollars to help offset initial costs. But be careful about taking uh, fundraising before you know what you're fundraising for or what the total need is. So, so for example, if at the first meeting you think, okay, for the next six months we're going to need uh, a few hundred dollars in order to uh, uh, do some mailings and start a website or whatever you might need a few hundred dollars for as you're getting organized. And so you ask everybody to chip in five bucks to make that happen. So, that's great. It's spreading it equitably. But you don't want to create the sense of, and people are like, oh, I, I paid my share. You know, there are yeah. different uh, stages that require significantly different needs, and you just want to be careful and strategic about um, when you need money and how much you need. And uh, so that member shares, you would not sell member shares until after you were incorporated and knew uh, and began to have a sense of what the what the needs were for those shares. Stuart, did that answer the that was a sort of multifaceted question? Yeah, I, I think it probably covered most of it. And I would just say that if anybody um, who did ask a question doesn't feel like they got the answer they needed, feel free to re re add another question, new question to clarify. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. Um, Here's a, a, an interesting one, I think. Members tend to want to see an interest, instant gratification of joining, and our board is thinking of an at-register discount rather than a dividend. We are very small. Curious what a realistic percentage could be for that. Um, I urge you not to have an at-register at discount. The next section of this seminar is going to be on uh, uh, the benefit to members. And um, uh, so I'm going to save the details of that. But just for now, say I urge you please to, to not do that. I think it is not sustainable. It will harm your co-op. And just because uh, members prefer immediate gratification uh, doesn't mean that we need to, to uh, support that. They need to understand initially that the gratification they get is that they have a co-op, a place where they can shop, and they wouldn't have had that if they hadn't joined. So uh, more detail about that in the, in the last section. I've, I've got about four more minutes before I need to go into that section, but I think I, I can take a couple of questions. 
All right. What about business memberships? Any good reason for doing a separate class for businesses, and how would that look different? Elizabeth, you want to tell us how you do it at the web? Oh, did I lose Elizabeth? Yes, I had to mute. Um, we have one time membership period. There are no classes of membership. A membership is a membership, and uh, that's written into our articles and bylaws. So a business can join, a co-op can join, a nonprofit can join, a living human person can join. That's it. They all pay the same. And they get no special forms, no special nothing. Now, this may be something you have to look at the incorporation law of your, of your co-op. I, I don't know, but we we are strictly for make it simple. No categories of membership. So it, uh, Fair enough. the laws in your state, um, but I see no reason to decline a membership to an entity. If that if, an, if a business wants to join, I think uh, as that's a member correct. that's fine. Yep. And great, but the laws of laws of your state may vary on that. We've made a lot of questions on that issue, so thank you. Uh, the uh, what about employees? What about offering employees uh, a membership as a benefit or some discount? Um, I, one of the cooperative principles is open and voluntary membership, and uh, I believe that that should apply to employees as well. Um, I think it's possible to make it easy for employees to, to join through payroll deduction or other means. Uh, it's obviously desirous uh, for the co-op that its employees are owners and understand the benefits of ownership. Uh, when they participate as owners, of course, they're participating as owners and not as employees, so they don't expect any any special benefits because of their uh, ownership of the cooperative. Um, but that that's um, uh, the, the cocoa uh, the cocoa mamas in our uh, in our developing the best practices did not address that. So I, I'm just reporting my my personal preferences to that. Um, uh, employees be encouraged to join, uh, but not be uh, re forced or required to join. Marilyn, may I just jump in ever so briefly? I think one of the reasons people get con uh, ways people get confused about this is they're still thinking of co-op membership in terms of a privilege or a club. And for our employees to be fully empowered as members, they have to be equal members. And we don't give our shares away anyway. That that would be the co-op. Handing it, share. We, you know, those shares are meant to benefit the co-op, and everyone contributes to be an equal partner. It's not a benefit; it's a privilege, and you and a responsibility. That that would be my perspective. Uh, Stuart, how about one more before we move on to member economic benefits? Sure. Uh, here's one that I, it's a little. Uh, uh, let's just do it. How about collecting member capital? By adding a small percentage to each purchase at checkout rather than having it prepaid. I need to think about that. That's a very good question. I haven't thought about it. Um, I'm tempted to answer it, but I think I'd better better think about it some more first. So whoever I can, wrote I, I can tell you one thing, Marilyn. Years okay. ago, in the wedge, uh, and this is back in the dawn of time, the 80s, the wedge had a shortfall. The board, in its wisdom, added a 1% markup at the register to every purchase to make up for it. Customers hated it. It generated huge amounts of bad will. And if you're adding at the register, you're, if you're forcing non you know, everybody to capitalize, that could be that could be. So just keep that in mind. It was perceived as you put this price on the shelf, and then at the front you're adding more, and it was, it was perceived as a bait and switch. So I'd tread carefully. All right, there's a there are quite a few questions we didn't get to, and, and I apologize. We'll uh, um, I think we may have a, a mechanism for answering them, but not necessarily that the whole group will see at a later time. Uh, I sure appreciate all the interest and all the questions. Um, it's uh, my hope that we can get to them all, um, and I'm also hoping that we can get through the full presentation so you have the benefit of everything that's here in addition to uh, as many of your questions as possible. So the last uh, section of the webinar, uh, starting with the next page, is um, 
on the uh, flip side of the member investment, it's the member economic benefit. The goal of the member economic uh, benefit is to have uh, benefits that the members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. The, the overall uh, primary benefit is the co-op itself and the value that it brings to the members in the community. As we talked about earlier, the co-op has to actually bring value to the members and to the community, and people have to perceive that and understand it. Uh, but that is, uh, assuming that it does do that, that is the primary value and the reason that a member would join is because they want that co-op to exist. Um, patronage refunds are an economic refund that members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. It is the economic benefit that uh, we recommend and uh, that we're going to spend most of the rest of the, the time uh, talking about. A patronage refund is a, is a system that has existed uh, for a long time, nearly since the beginning of the, of the cooperative movement uh, in the 1800s uh, with the first um, the Rochdale pioneers in England. Uh, the idea is that uh, a patronage refund is the surplus, that, that the purpose of the co-op is to operate at cost. We're not trying to make money off of our members, uh, but we don't know until the end of the year whether or not we actually had surplus. So patronage refunds uh, say that at the end of the year we had surplus. And so that surplus comes uh, from a, uh, an unintended overcharge and so we want to return that to the members. Uh, looking at the slide on the next page, we get into why uh, patronage refunds create uh, economic return that members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. Uh, first of all, it creates that mutually beneficial relationship with owners. It encourages membership and member investment. It is a system that is designed so that both the co-op and the members prosper. That one does not prosper at the expense of the other, but that they prosper together mutually. The members trust that the co-op won't profit off of the members' business because the surplus is returned in proportion to how much they use the business. It engages members. People pay attention to patronage. It makes use of a very important cooperative advantage. Um, the Internal Revenue Service has an in entire section of its code, subchapter T, that describes the advantage, the, the patronage refund, uh, advantage that cooperatives have, the way that, that your cooperative can be distinct from other businesses in the community. There are other businesses that, are, that offer discounts uh, for a limited time, period of time, for if you have the right color card or whatever. Uh, there are not, uh, there, it's rare to have other businesses in your, in your community that offer ownership and offer a share of the profits. It is a cooperative advantage. It builds capital. It provides uh, resources that the cooperative need for, needs for the future. More money stays in the community um, and less is paid in taxes and it re because it reduces the cost tax obligations. Now, there are some in the uh, corporate world who object to a, a cooperative, the cooperative's tax status uh, by, by being able to uh, protect some of the profits from being taxed. The, the reality is that um, the, the money that you're returning to members was taxed by the, gover by the government when that member earned it. Uh, so that's the reason that it's not taxed. If you, if you earn your money at your job, you go to the store and you buy your food, and at the end of the year, the store says, hey, we charge you too much for your food. Here's the excess back. Um, it's not taxable because it's excess that you spent on your purchases. You already paid tax on your, uh, on your income when you earned it as income. So that's why it's not taxable to the member and it's not taxable to the co-op because the co-op isn't keeping it, it's returning it to the member. Now, if any of you are involved with other types of cooperatives uh, or if any of your uh, consumers are businesses or using their purchases for business purposes, 
uh, the tax status is different. I'm talking about uh, for consumer co-ops and uh, items that are bought for personal consumption at your home and for your family. The uh, Patrons refunds also uh, creates an appropriate pressure for the cooperative to generate profits so that those profits, uh, share of those profits can be returned to the members based on purchases. As we talked about earlier, it's important for the cooperative to be successful as a business, to be profitable. Uh, there's nothing wrong with profits. Profits are a really good thing. It's, uh, the, what's questionable uh, is what happens to those profits. Who benefits from the profit? that a business makes. And in a cooperative, who benefits are the users, the customers, the people who generated that profit. Uh, that's a very uh, unique and uh, radical idea in, under capitalism. So profit can be good and healthy, and we want the co-op to make profit. In the next slide, uh, we look at the benefits of patronage refunds, both for the co-op and for the member. Uh, the co-op, it's a responsible method of returning surplus. Uh, in, in my mind, a discount is not a responsible method because you're returning surplus before there's any surplus, before you know if you've been profitable. Um, the second reason that it's good for the co-op is it encourages growth of membership. It's, an, uh, it's a concept that people are not necessarily familiar with. It re will require some education, but once they get used to it and it becomes known in your community, it does drive membership. Um, I'll ask Elizabeth in a, in a little bit to explain uh, how patronage refunds work at the Wedge and how their members love the patronage refund system. Um, Another benefit for the, of the of patronage refunds is that they are sustainable even if all the customers are members. Um, I once managed a co-op where we actually had a disincentive to grow our membership because the more members we had, the more it cost us and the harder it was to be successful. And it was a bad structure and I'm glad we changed it. Uh, start out with a structure that will work, that will be sustainable, and that will, will have you wanting uh, all of your customers to want to join the co-op. Now, not all of them will. Lots of people aren't joiners, uh, but that's okay. Uh, create a system that even if they did, the co-op would be, uh, that would just make the co-op healthier and stronger. Um, patronage refunds allow the co-op to retain uh, some of those profits to reinvest in improved services. If in your assessment as leaders, that is more valuable to the members than a refund. As we'll see later, you, you do have to return at least 20%, uh, but you can retain 80 um, in the member's name and reinvest in services. Um, the last, so let's skip to the last bullet on this side that they're flexible. Uh, you can vary your strategy from year to year. You're not making a commitment at the, begin, at the beginning of the year or in some cases a commitment now that you may have to live with for a very long time. So be careful what you promise. Uh, have it be a, a, a program that will be based on the success of your co-op and have some flexibility built into it so that you make a decision annually about the return on investment to members. For the members, uh, the benefit is that it does provide a fair rate of return for their investment. Remember, they will get their investment back uh, should they ever want to leave the co-op. So in addition to that, they get their patronage refund uh, they get their um, any other uh, uh, member specials or sales that you might have from time to time in the year. Uh, and that is all in addition to getting their investment back in the end. And the biggest benefit, of course, that the store exists. Um, there are no tax implications for the member if the pur purchases were made for their personal use. Uh, it encourages the co-op to improve services so that it, it grows sales and makes the store even um, more likely to meet the member's needs. I'm not going to read through all of those. You can look at those at your leisure, but let's turn, the, turn to the next page and just begin to look at how they work. Um, uh, the Internal Revenue Service has a set of rules. Uh, they're not very many. It's uh, really only five sections of subchapter T. 
uh, but it's important to understand and follow the rules carefully to be sure that the club is entitled to receive the tax deduction. Uh, this workshop today is a general advice. You will need to seek legal and accounting help on uh, your specific issues and be sure you get um, all the forms and uh, everything correct. Um, but this is a good general overview. The Internal Revenue Service Subchapter T requires that you operate on a cooperative basis. In other words, that uh, the, the owners, the members are the owners, and that the, it's structured so that they are in, entitled to the, uh, the benefits based on their patronage. Um, if at least 85% of the gross receipts are for personal living or family use, you can file a, a form one time. Uh, at the, be at the beginning of your existence, you won't have to file that again unless the IRS changes its code. Um, you will need the consent of members, usually through the bylaws, that they will include patronage refund in their taxable income. Now, this will seem odd um, because, as I said before, it will not be taxable for them. Uh, but because many, many cooperatives in the United States are not consumer co-ops, uh, but our agricultural worker or some other kind of co-op where the patronage refund is taxable income, the IRS is unwilling to make different rules for different kinds of co-ops. So we all have to follow the same rule um, and, and uh, ensure that the member has the responsibility for determining whether or not they would owe taxes on it. Uh, you can advise them that for if they're using it for their own uh, personal consumption, then it would not be taxable. Uh, next, according to the Internal Revenue Service, a pre-existing obligation must exist. They must have an agreement with members, either a signed agreement or in the bylaws, that you have an obligation to return profits to them uh, based on their use. So the IRS treats the co-op as a pass-through entity, that profits represent an overcharge to be returned. And then just a note here, in addition to the IRS rules, you want to be sure and attend to whatever uh, incorporation rules you may have in your state. Uh, another slide on how patronage works, and then we'll look at a couple of examples uh, for patronage. Uh, next slide, please. The one after this one, how do patronage refunds work, number two? Number two. Okay, Sorry. right there. Um, so the first thing uh, that you need to do at the end of the year is divide your net income into that which came from member business and that which came from non-member business and any non-patronage source income. Um, patronage refund is a tool for net income on member business. So first you've got to divide that out. It's usually done by a percentage of sales to members. So in the example that Elizabeth gave before, the wedge has 76% uh, of its sales to members, so they would uh, use that to calculate of their net earnings how much of that is eligible for patronage refund. Uh, the next step is to calculate each member's share of that income, the total uh, the sales, based on their purchases. Any non-patronage refund, any, sorry, any non-patronage net income will be taxed, um, or any uh, non any income that's related to another part of the business. And the last thing here is that after you've calculated how much uh, each member share of the net is, you have an obligation to return at least 20% of that in cash to the member. The remainder, 80%, can be retained and allocated to the member's equity account. So if the co-op has some ongoing capital needs, you'll probably want to retain that 80% so that you can reinvest that in the business to improve your ability to, to meet those members' needs. On the next page is a little flow chart that just reviews this, uh, this same process that I was uh, going through in tech. Uh, starting with the net income at the top, uh, dividing that from into member patronage and non-member and non-patronage income. 
Um, so we're going to focus here on the left side of this flow chart, the member source net income. Uh, the first decision that the, the board on behalf of the members would make is, is of that net income, do we want to allocate it to our member owners or not allocate it? If it's not allocated and, and it's in the green box, uh, then it's the same as non-member. It's taxable income for the cooperative. Uh, in the yellow box is that, that that is allocated to member owners and it's credited to their individual account and deductible from the co-op's income tax obligation. Uh, note again that the, a minimum of 20% uh, needs to be distributed to the members and a maximum of 80% can be retained and uh, tax free retained uh, and put into the equity capital of the cooperative in the name of the member. So that's the general flow. Uh, on the next page we have a table that gives an example of how this might work. I want to thank Bruce Meyer from uh, Wegner and Associates uh, for this example. Uh, uh, on the first column is a non-patronage allocation. Uh, on the right-hand side we have the patronage allocation. For, for this example, uh, again, we're going to use some round numbers. We're using $100,000 of uh, net income for this cooperative. In this particular example, we're saying that they had 75% of sales were to members and 25% to non-members. So it's divided, the net income is divided into those two categories. The um, it, it, if we stayed on the, the, the first column on the left, uh, that 100000 is all taxable. Um, we're just guessing at a tax bracket here, saying that the cost tax bracket is approximately uh, 22500 That's the outlay of cash. Uh, so there is some uh, profit that stays into the community, uh, but 22000 of it was paid out in uh, taxes to the government. And on the right-hand side, we look at a different scenario. That if we look at a patronage scenario, that first we um, look at the dis distribution between member and non-member. Then in this case, uh, the co-op decided to keep $5,000 in of member sales in uh, member sales profit, and is going to allocate the other 70%. Uh, allocate, I'm sorry, $70,000. So the taxes that they would pay on that is at the same rate, but it, in this case it would be only uh, $750 plus the tax on the non-member sales. So you see that their tax obligation is, is significantly less, uh, just over $4,000 instead of the $22,000. Now, as we've mentioned, 20% of the patronage must be paid in cash. So we take 20% of the, of the 70000 and that's going to be a cash outlay. So that $14,000 will be divided up amongst the members in proportion to how much uh, they purchased at the cooperative. So in this scenario, the total cash outlay is 18500 that includes the cash, the 20% in cash, and the taxes on the two components. But here's the, uh, at the bottom line, there's a big difference. Uh, so there's a big difference in the amount of cash that's paid out, a savings of, of $4,000 in cash for the co-op, but also a difference in how much of that money stays in the community. Um, just a couple more slides before uh, I'll take questions again. The next one is about the decisions that are that are implied in these uh, two examples that we've looked at. The first one is the decision about the amount of allocation. How much of our uh, member sales profit do we want to allocate? Uh, you've got to follow the tax rules, state statutes, and any pre-existing agreements. 
uh, that you have with members, remembering that any part that you don't allocate, you will owe taxes on. Uh, the next decision you have is, is, of the amount we allocate, how much will we distribute? You must distribute at least 20%. It's possible to distribute more, uh, but uh, if the co-op has some capital needs, you would likely want to retain the, the full value of the 80% that you're entitled to retain. Uh, the rest is put in the name of the cooperative and used in the, in the co-op. Uh, the co-op gets the tax deduction for the full amount, uh, whether it's paid out or not. So decide on the amount of distribution. And then on the next page is the last annual decision, which is how are you going to distribute the distributed portion. Again, that's normally 20%. It must be available at cash as cash, but you can issue it as a store certificate. So if you have a, a register system that can keep track of it, uh, you can issue it automatically that way or, or mail people a store certificate. The IRS does require that if the member prefers cash that you must uh, pay it in cash. You also have to make this payout within uh, eight and a half months at the end of the year. Uh, and before filing your taxes. So uh, many cops try to, you have eight and a half months to distribute it, and some cops try to time that so that your patronage checks go out around holiday time or uh, uh, before April 15th to help um, members have a little bit of cash on hand during those uh, periods of time. Uh, you can also set a minimum amount of a payout. Uh, for example, if, if a person's share is $1 or less, that it wouldn't be uh, paid out, but just keep in mind that if you do that, uh, you don't you don't get to uh, deduct any of that member's al allocation from your taxes. Also, anyone who doesn't claim their cash portion or doesn't cash their check or their member certificate is excluded uh, from from both patronage, and you've got to pay the tax on that usually in the next tax year. But you have to keep track of those. You actually want to encourage people. To, uh, to cash those checks and use it. Um, that's the end. Before we take questions, I just want to give Elizabeth a chance to describe uh, the situation at the Wedge. I, uh, thank you, Marilyn. I was just hearing the woman say muting canceled, so I missed the last word you said. Hello? To explain how you do it at the Wedge. Okay. Uh, yes, we do send out patronage refund uh, every November. Just before Thanksgiving, uh, our fiscal year is July 1 through June 30. So by November, we are the decisions have been made, and we're ready to cut the check. Uh, we've distributed in the last five years over two million five hundred thousand dollars, and members absolutely love them. Uh, we do send checks. Uh, we have been told. I think it depends on what lawyer you talk to. We've been told Minnesota requires us to send checks. However, I've noticed an increasing number of Minnesota co-ops sending out uh, store certificates, so maybe that's changed, or maybe that was one lawyer's opinion. Um, regarding the 20% rule, Marilyn, what we we in Minnesota have to send 20% of the net, so we always the minimum we always allocate of the whole proportion is 22 or 23% because then we're covered for the people who never cash their checks. That's how our accountant has told us. So. You, again, it's just all with your own lawyer and your own accountant who knows your state statutes and their interpretations. Um, but we have given as low as 22 or 23 percent, as high as 60 percent in cash. Uh, we do have to explain the withheld portion to a certain number of people every year, usually new members. And I've found a very effective way of discussing that is in terms of uh, passing on a legacy to the future generation of cooperators. And that's something that gets a lot of people strangely jazzed. Um, but we, of course, take our own checks. These are not third-party checks. So often what happens after patronage refund over the next week as people are shopping for Thanksgiving, they're just buying their groceries by signing over their checks at the registers. Um, they leave very happy. Uh, very rarely have we had complaints, although people do start to expect it. So if you give an outstandingly high refund one year, even though you really shouldn't have, you will pay for that for years. So the wisdom of the decision 
it cannot be, you know, the importance of these wise stewardship decisions that are really based on long-term view, not short-term feeling that we have to give people something right away or they'll leave. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, there are uh, two more slides after this one that I, I'm, Mari, I'm just going to ask you to put those up while I answer people's questions. We're so we're so close on time that I want to at least take a few questions here. Uh, while we're showing these slides, I won't I won't be reading off of these slides, however. You ready for those questions, then, Marilyn? Yeah, let's take one, Stuart. Right. Um. There are a lot, as you can imagine. This is complicated material, but. If one of the, a couple of them along the same lines. When you do hold a patronage refund in reserve, how would it would it be accessible to the member at some future point, or how would you um, would you ever set up a revolving fund to reimburse that held equity? Uh, that's a strategic decision on on behalf of the co-op. Uh, whatever program you set up, you must treat all members the same. Um, Elizabeth was just describing their method there at the wedge, and you may want to re repeat that in answer to this question. Some co-ops uh, do make that available when the member wants to leave, uh, so they could get uh, both portions back. Others uh, don't only refund the in initial investment, um, and still others uh, revolve that uh, patronage refund. Uh, the part that they've held when the co-op no longer needs. If you ever if you have, find you have too much capital, if you ever find yourself in that situation, you can always begin to refund it then, um, as long as you treat all members the same. Elizabeth, do you want to say again about your? Yes, uh, because we're incorporated under Minnesota co-op law, we are not required to revolve uh, past retained patronage refund out. I think some state laws that uh, co-op laws do, so you'd need to be in consistent with the law you're incorporating under. This is why I'm a big fan of Minnesota law. Uh, again, we talk about leaving a legacy, that we're standing on the shoulders of people who worked for next to nothing or volunteered, who never got anything back, and that we're sending uh, the, the benefit of the co-op forward into the future of the community. And so we do not ever promise that people will get the retained portion back. And in fact, that opens up a whole other can of worms with SG laws because if the board starts re open, you know, recalling old equity, you have to locate people you may not have seen in 15 years. So that starts a new uh, SG clock ticking. You don't even want to. We don't want to go there. If we find we have excess capital, we uh, give a bigger patronage refund in a given year. Quite frankly, um, yeah. Let us uh, take, take another question, Stuart. Yeah, we, you know, on that on those patronage uh, that patronage amount that you have, if the membership approved it, could you use that theoretically for um, a donation to another organization, or, or is it restricted to cooperative uses? Uh, the members can donate their portion, so their 20% if they wanted to donate it back to a, a, a cooperative foundation fund that you may have set up at your cooperative, they can do that. But it has to be an active decision. They can't just simply not return the check and say, oh, well, it, I wanted you to donate it. They, they have to actually sign it over. Um, as far as the uh, retained portion, I think the reason that you would retain a portion is to, to serve, to, to be able to better serve the member's needs. And you would be in the best to Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. So you would be in the best position to know what your members need. Uh, so we are... Um, at the end of our time that we've set aside today, I know that there are still questions, and uh, I hope that uh, you were able to get uh, the good information, even if we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Um, we'll, there will be uh, some more seminars, and we'll, we'll just do our best. Uh, my, check um, uh, our, out our website and, and some other tools, and we'll, we'll try to help you as best we can. Uh, Kevin, do you want to? Uh, Wrap us up. Sure. I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, participating. 
uh, to remember that there is a uh, evaluation process and uh, we look for and a registration process for uh, next week's uh, webinar coming up and would welcome uh, uh, as many of you back as uh, are interested in able and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thanks very much. For so I will end the webinar, and that should uh, that should generate a uh, an evaluation screen coming to uh, all the participants.